1846, Grace Episcopal Church opened at 10th and Broadway. If you've ever seen it, it's still there today. It's a, it's a large, beautiful uh, Gothic church. Um, and at the time, everyone recognized it was the place to see and be seen. Philip Hone, a famous New York City diarist, um, wrote as the consecration approached that it's already its aisles are filled with gay parties of ladies and feathers, uh, dresses and dandies with mustaches and high heeled boots. It was almost like, you know, a weekly Met Gala where people dressed to the nine, nines um, and went in a search of being seen by other fashionable people. It was a place to be seen back in the day. It's kind of hard to imagine people treating um, or thinking, um, orienting themselves around um, church services in that way today. Methodists were distinct at that time for having what we um, called free pews. Uh, there's actually still a remnant of this rule in today's book of discipline. We're not allowed to charge rent for pews. All sorts of other congregations throughout the city and, and, and in other parts of the country and world as well had pew rentals and um, pews that were uh, considered, you know, sort of the best seats in the house and other places where you could be very visible and be very seen and be acknowledged as a, you know, good and generous churchgoer with lots of resources to give the church. Those pews cost more. So, so pews on the aisle towards the front, those, those were the pricier pews. Um, uh, but you had to pay for your seat in the house of God. Um, and those would come up for renewal from year to year. And it meant uh, a few things. It meant that um, Methodist churches, because they, they couldn't raise money uh, by selling pews in advance of building a church, tended to have more modest um, church edifices, right? So, so the, the church, uh, churches that we were building here in the city and in other places, um, at least at one point, tended not to be as elegant or grand as some other churches that were able to raise money in advance of the building. And the expectation that you would be able to, you know, rent this great seat. The other thing it meant was that often sailors and immigrants and other uh, more working class people who did not have the money to spare to buy themselves a great seat in a fancy pants kind of church um, ended up at a lot of Methodist churches because they could sit. They didn't have to sort of stand in the back or hope they got there um, uh, for the, the handful of seats that might have been available. There were a number of churches where uh, people of, of more modest or extraordinarily modest means stood in the back or in the balcony while prime real estate um, went unoccupied um, close to the front of the church. This became, you know, part of the distinctive character of Methodism, particularly in the early American Methodist period. And the, and the, the period after the Revolutionary War, um, as the church was growing, it was growing among folks who, uh, you know, often didn't have money for pew rent. Um, and among people who were, uh, you know, new to the city, or among sailors who were um, just visiting the city and weren't about to, you know, keep a pew ready uh, for the times that they were um, in the vicinity. This was a distinctive character of the early uh, American Methodist movement, that our churches were more modest, but they were places where all might feel welcome, even if they might not feel seen in the way that um, that uh, you might expect in other more elegant church buildings. 
Now, I, I'm here today to advocate for the notion that the church is uh, a place you're supposed to be seen, but not in the sense of, of being seen for your fashionable uh, person or your importance or your ability to uh, secure yourself uh, uh, one of the best seats in the house. The church is intended, uh, I uh, want to advocate for, as a place to be seen, to be heard, and to be known. And not only that, I want to look at the text that we've heard from this very early part of Acts, right? Immediately after um, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit comes upon the church, one of their uh, distinctive marks is uh, the community that the Holy Spirit is able to form among them. And these are people who are experiencing uh, uh, being seen, being heard, and being known among one another. Not, not because they're stylish or grand, but because they have been formed into a very distinctive and particular kind of community. Listen to all of the awe and wonder and joy that is present just in these few verses. The marks of this community is that, that all had come upon everyone. They gathered together. It says they spent much time together. They ate together. They broke bread together. And, and when they ate, when they were gathered around a table together, they, they had glad and generous hearts. Such was the, the nature and character of their belonging that they experienced the goodwill of anyone who encountered them. And such was the draw of that kind of quality that day by day, people were being drawn into their gathering and into their community. These are the distinguishing, distinguishing and distinctive marks of a community that is drawn together by the Holy Spirit. It's a place of community where people are known, they're seen, they're heard, where they don't feel quite so alone. This is the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the gift that is you know, present and available to us, uh, to Christians anywhere and to us uh, as a community here that gathers uh, in olden times in lower Manhattan. Um, and I think that's a particularly powerful opportunity and a particularly powerful gift in this, uh, in this city. Where you can be in huge crowds and you can be surrounded by um, all kinds of people and all kinds of noise and all kinds of activity and still sometimes, you know, not feel recognized or known. You can, you can be around people all the time and, and not feel seen or heard or understood at all. You know, that, that's something that I think is probably a very common experience for a lot of folks in this city. And the sheer number of people can be overwhelming. And we, if we want to get to create um, a, a community of people that is shaped by the Holy Spirit and if we're shaped by the Holy Spirit, some of the things we can expect to experience for ourselves and to offer to others are, you know, a, a, a gathering of people that are full of joy and wonder, that come together and appreciate one another's company, one another's thoughts, one another's ideas that engage in, uh, you know, conversation and thinking and discussion that lifts us up and that helps us discern our way forward. We 
can be a gathering of people that are inspired and inspiring and, and that are generous. Now, there's more than one way to be generous. One of the things the church has necessarily emphasized in all of the years since the Holy Spirit crafted us into a being and into a body is the need for financial generosity. If we're going to, um, to come together and sustain our work and meet the needs of the most vulnerable um, in the world, then, then you know, People's financial generosity is a key piece of that equation, right? But there's other ways we're called and, and need to be generous with one another and, and with people who come into our sphere, right? Who come into proximity to who we are and how we are. One of the, the ways we need to be generous with one another is, um, is in making space, for one another. Uh, we need to be generous in, in how we listen to one another. We need to, to be um, generous in how we see one another. Um, you know, in order for us to be generous with one another, sometimes it's going to require us to stop talking so that somebody else can get heard. And it's, it's going to require us to step back so somebody else can be seen. These are really important mechanisms of generosity that help to create the kind of community that we hear described in Acts, to create the, the, the kind of community that reflects the power of the Holy Spirit. And that kind of community can be a truly remarkable and special and distinctive experience um, for those who are feeling a little bit lost um, or lonely in the world. Think about the power of, of coming into a space, either, uh, either a virtual space like you know, our Bible study or our coffee hour um, or our physical space where we, when we um, you know, get to be back in our building. Think about the, the power of um, being able to, to come in and be made welcome among a people who like each other and are joyful um, with one another. Um, who, who, who like being present to one another, but, but who also are able to step aside so that you can be present to them, right? I mean, one of the challenges in a community of people who like one another is that sometimes they forget to, to, to open the circle and to make space um, for others who they don't yet know. One of the things that um, having done church for a really, really long time is that I'm, 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 I've learned more than once and seen evidence of more than once is that just because there's um, lots of uh, uh, room in the church and there's lots of space in the pews doesn't mean there's actually a lot of space in a congregation, right? There can be uh, plenty of places to sit and nowhere to belong. Uh, you know, churches uh, are notorious for folks who sit in the same place every single Sunday and it's their spot, right? I mean, every church um, has stories of, of folks who, um, you know, that that was their, that was their seat. Um, and I, I, I am confident that most folks, if they walk in and find a visitor sitting in their seat, they're gonna be, totally great about it and the visitor will never um uh you know feel like they've made some invisible misstep but i also have utter confidence that that there are folks who um uh see somebody in their seat look around and see a plenty of other places to sit um, but still make the visitor move um, I served a, a church once where um, there was a parishioner who not only sat in the same seat every uh, Sunday, but she uh, 
kept things there, like a pillow <laughs> and other items. Like that's how comfortable she was in her spot. Um, and, uh, you know, just because there's plenty of places to sit doesn't mean there's actually room. And, and these are um, things that churches can be mindful of and aware of and make conscious decisions about to be more inclusive, to make space, to uh, open the circle, uh, to, to do things that create the kind of community that's possible in the power of the Holy Spirit, that's joyful and hopeful and awe-filled and inspired and um, financially and spiritually um, and socially generous in ways that people can walk in and feel made welcome. People can walk in and have a sense of, of home and belonging. People, people can, can come a few times and, and have a sense that they've found their tribe. They've identified their clan in this city, you know, that they, that they, have, uh, they have come upon their people and have a sense of, of belonging and welcome um, and, and feel like they have found a place uh, of like-hearted people. And they now can join in a collective effort where everybody's you know, pulling in the same direction and, and aimed toward a common purpose. And I really want us to be aware of how remarkable and special and unique and significant a thing that is. In a world where people are quite busy and pulled in all sorts of directions and constantly looking at their phones and um, you know, have so much brought to them in boxes uh, via a, a variety of shipping methods and live such insular, closed off lives. In a world where it's, it's hard sometimes to be seen and heard and known, the church is a singular place where people can be welcomed and understand that they belong, they belong. They have a team, they have a purpose and they're welcomed and loved and cherished just as they are. That, that's not a small thing, y'all. That's, that's not even remotely a small thing. And as we think about who we want to be post-pandemic, I, I really think that that is key. That we think about, you know, how we make room, how we stop talking to listen to others so that they know they're heard, how, how we um, step aside and create a space um, for somebody to step in and, and be seen and be known and for them, them to, to feel that feel that. It's, it's not a small thing. Not remotely. Not remotely. You know, I think that the, um, the phrase of, uh, of this uh, pandemic is, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, all of us uh, who've done any amount of Zoom, any quantity of Zoom, have obvious have either said that or had it said to us probably more than twice. Um, you know, you're on mute. The world can very often make us feel like we're on mute, and they kind of like it that way. Our coming together 
as people following Jesus, committed to being Jesus' disciples, and having been formed into a community by the Holy Spirit is by definition a place where nobody wants you to be on mute. And a gathering where you finally get to stop asking, can you hear me now? Because you know, you're home. Heard, welcome seen and ultimately known. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.